Welcome to Pod King. Hello. 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 Steven. Steven. Okay. Dealer. All right. Hi. Welcome to Five White Guys with Three Microphones. This is Pod King. Um, so this is a session that is uh, looking back, looking at now, and looking forward about podcasting itself. Uh, that archaic art of creating audio and video and putting it on the internet. So this was the original reason I actually was coming back to PyCamp, was to uh, run this panel. And then uh, I was asked to do the keynote as well. So if you're wondering, I'm not speaking the entire weekend. It's just these first two sessions. Um, but my name is Justin Kanaki. In addition to being one of the co-founders of PodCamp Pittsburgh, uh, in 2003, I had started a uh, podcast, a web video series called Something to be Desired, which we ran for six years. Uh, it wound up getting front page on YouTube and getting what we thought at the time were good views, tens of thousands of views. Got nominated in 2008 for a Yahoo Video Award for Best Web Series, which we didn't win, but that's okay because it's nice to be nominated. Uh, and then in 2009, I moved to Baltimore, and basically that whole thing shut down. We, uh, we did one more year of it as a spin-off called The Baristas, which we uh, crowdfunded on Kickstarter, and I learned how much money I should have asked for versus how much we actually needed, because the $3,000 that we raised were gone, I think, in the time it took me to drive back to Pittsburgh. So it was an interesting learning experience on how to crowdfund media, and I can write a book about it at some point called Don't Do This Ever, but I might. So uh, as you noticed, uh, Mike Sword to my left is recording this, because when you're at a pod camp, everything is live and on the internet all the time. Uh, I'm Periscope because it's cool. Hey, Periscopers. <laughs> Looking good. Um, this panel is a group of the people who were creating podcasts nine years ago. Uh, if we were to do this nine years from now, the people who would be sitting here are very different from us because, in fact, not all of us are still creating a podcast. But what we wanted to get together and talk about was what has changed over the years? What was it like then? What is it like now, and where is it going next? So for those of you in the audience who I presume either are making or are about to make a podcast and want to know how to do it well, learn from what we did right and wrong. So introducing from my left to my right, uh, Will Rutherford and Mike Sorg are the uh, co-creators of multiple web properties in Pittsburgh. I like to think that they literally are the reason the podcast still exists, because they and their 1,700 shows are most of the media that's produced in, in Pittsburgh these days. I don't have a number how many we do right now. It's exciting. I've never heard anybody say that it wasn't us. <laughs> it's a, no, no, it's so in addition to the Wrestling Mayhem show and the Awesome Cast and Basic Sorgonomics and Sawtooth Willie, and what, what are the other shows that I listen to? You do. Uh, I do Panel Riot, a uh, comic book-based podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, we do together the uh, LB, and, LB and the Sword Morning Afternoon Power Hour. That's just for fun. Uh, let's see, Awesome Cast, Awesome, ca awesome Chat. Indie Mayhem Show. Our friends are doing uh, the Midweek Wars and the Raw Wrap Ups, and also various wrap ups of whatever WWE reality television is going on. I can't even keep up. I just get like, hey, post this. Um, and uh, do we do anything else? Boss Panel. InsertCoinToBegin.com. Yeah. Uh, this is going to be a panel of just them talking about uh, it. I have some, have some line ones Fishing Without, not, not you, no, Fishing no. Without Bait, Educational Grand Rounds with Seclair. Uh, so those are, those are clients yeah. that do that. So that's not even part of like the network. And is that covered? I think that covers, and all of those are under the uh, Sorgatron Media banner. Yeah. Yep. So this this is a group of uh, gentlemen who started out loving wrestling and making podcasts about wrestling, and it just kept growing from there to where they now make podcasts about everything they love, which is everything. They're very lovable men. Mm -hmm. On my right, we have two equally lovable men who I like to think like each other, please. Uh, immediately to my right is Doug Durda, and to his right is John Carmen, who uh, created two of the other long-running podcasts in Pittsburgh history. Uh, and then those podcasts sort of went very separate ways over the past nine years. We can talk about that. So, gentlemen, if you want to introduce yourselves and how you did what you did briefly. How I did what I did. How did you do that? Well, so I have a podcast called Should I Drink That? And most times, yes, you should. <laughs> we'll, we'll let you know if you shouldn't, trust me. Uh, it's a craft beer podcast. And, uh, it's been based here in Pittsburgh since 2006. Still running. Kind of. Yeah, not wood. Not not metal not flyboard, I don't know what this is. So still going strong. Uh, originally it started with myself and my co-host, Sick Puppy, because who wants to listen to Doug and Brad talk about beer? So we had to come up with some cool names. Uh, since then, it's, podcasting has definitely taken off for us, and it's, it, 
it's introduced me to a lot of great people. I never thought that I would still be podcasting nine years since we started. In fact, it was PodCamp, the original one, that uh, kind of gave us the kick in the butt that hey, maybe we could actually do something with this. And now nine years later, uh, covering Beer Fest, getting to go to breweries, get free beer. That's the plus. If you can find your niche and find something really cool, you can sometimes get free stuff out of it. So so lesson number one, start a podcast about something that gives away things for free. Very important. Or you could try to get stuff for free out of it. People will we're give half you joking. I mean, we're not really sometimes joking. it works. Free beer is always a good thing. Free food's even better, too. If I can get both, excellent. I think you just had a podcast idea. Should I eat that? We, I think we tried that one. I think actually. we just piloted that last night on Periscope. <laughs> we had, for anyone who didn't see it on Periscope, we actually took two oatmeal cookies and put bacon in the middle of it and made a sandwich. Oh, it was good. Oh, yeah. you, you don't think it tastes good, but you're going to try that as soon as you leave here. You know, Th I, thanks to Jameson's, who's one of our sponsors for providing me the bacon also. I'll take bacon. I didn't feel like I was in Pittsburgh until this moment right now, putting bacon between my kids, but now I know. That's what we do here. Yes. And I can probably find you a beer to go with it, too. And do we have to slide the mic down for John? Justin, I'm sorry that I'm creative with their food in Baltimore, but um, <laughs> my name is John Carmen, and I used to be a podcaster. I'm sorry. I was hoping someone would stand up and say hello, John. John. Hi, John. Hi, John. Hi. We know nobody's been to AA in here. Okay. Yeah, all right. Once a podcaster, always a podcaster. I like to think that's true. It, but because the podcast lives on, right? It's it's still on. Even if you're not actively producing it. Yeah. So, do you want to talk about the podcast, or do you want to let that not exist as a topic? I can't remember all the names, but no. Uh, we, uh, my partner and I, had a podcast called the G Spot. At one point, it was the second biggest GLBT podcast uh, in the country. Um, the biggest was a daily show. We did a weekly show, so I think that might come up at some point as far as frequency. You know, we got the high end to the low end of frequency over here. <laughs> I don't know how you guys do it, honestly. So I think if one of the, and we'll open this up for questions at the end, but I have a few uh, preconceived thoughts I want to get out of these gentlemen, and then we'll open it up to see uh, what they can teach you directly. But, wow, I blow that up. Yeah, it's a little weird. All right. Um, never look at yourself on Periscope while you're talking. It's very yeah. <laughs> So, it is. So I want to start with the two of you because you've been making media for so long, and you keep finding either reasons or excuses to do it, I'm not sure. But what is it that motivated you to start, and has that changed as the podcasting ecosystem evolved or devolved over these past 10 years? How, how is that different for you? Well, that's, well okay, let's start well, how, how did we start? As all good things start, uh, we were drunk at a party. Yes. And uh, <laughs> consistently, Sawyer and I went to college together. Um, and, not uh, here. Not here, no. no. Different college. I, I don't think we're legally allowed to name the other college. No, no. I think there's um, some, yeah. We would go to parties, we'd get drunk, and we'd find ourselves the only two people sitting in a corner talking about wrestling. Every time. And this would happen again and again and again. And uh, Sorg, I think you were, um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, you were doing a, uh, a live cast at the oh, time. Uh, we were, Beth and I were talking about this on the recent uh, Awesome Chat, uh, where we were like both, like we're like the only people that were doing Shopcast servers Shop at cast, the time. Yeah, that was it, yeah. Through, because I had a site called WesternPAJuggalos.com, uh, and uh, we were just streaming music and having fun, and I had people in like California logging into my little server sitting on my Comcast connection, uh, and we're depending on this podcasting idea came across. Right. And we were just like, hey, this is a good conversation. Yeah, let's have these conversations so other people can listen to them, and then we're not just ignoring our friends and parties. Which is also how we started the Awesome Cast, because yeah. myself and Brock De La Creda, who's mm -hmm. doing two awesome things to be on the podcast right now, uh, that's how we started that one as well. Right. So, yeah. And your expectations when you're starting that one, what? Maybe we'll get Nothing. 10 people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 10 people and <laughs> have a conversation the with each show, other. The show and now you have 12, which is a lot. Exactly. Yeah, and all those people are on the show now. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is true, yeah, the community that creates itself. Yeah. So, so you wanted a small audience. You exceeded that, for certain. So have your expectations of what your podcast can achieve <laughs> change as you keep producing them. I, I think that, um, like you said, we started with a, we wanted a small audience, we got a small audience, mm -hmm. and then other things happened that we didn't expect. We got to interview uh, WWE legends like Jimmy Superfly, so okay, he's been on the show. Jerry Sags, not the blonde one. Right, not the blonde the one, nasty, the other nasty boy. The other nasty boys. People um, have been like recently on TV, like, uh, I don't know if their names are really resonating. Eric Young. Eric Young, who's on TNA now, uh, Davari. 
uh, uh, Alejandro Estrada. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's not running. So you're, you're, you're meeting famous people. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they like you. And we've gotten heavily involved in the local uh, indie wrestling scene, so much so that Sword gets paid to do <laughs> real life things for them. They pay him American style money yeah, to film that. and produce DVDs for them. Sometimes now. Canadian style, like it's weird. <laughs> sometimes Canadian. Yeah, sometimes Canadian, yeah, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes a hot dog. Uh, but no, it, it, that's been the biggest thing, because if, if nothing else, like it's turned into this other thing, like with, because now I do local productions for ind independent pro wrestling. And, uh, and it's like we, we're not on mics every week. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that's turned into, I actually just kind of broke off and relaunched IndieWrestling.us is my kind of like where I'm selling those things now to split it off to, from the other names, like a brand a little better. And uh, as far as like the show itself, we kind of split that off. The interviews happen over here. The discussion happens over here. We're, we're, we're looking at different audiences because of people interested in that independent wrestling. And, and, and uh, we're just looking to just keep finding new people. And, uh, and 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 to join our version of the conversation. You know? Did you say finding or buying? Finding. 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 We, are, no, we can't buy anything right now. But but uh, so. But, 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 you, but maybe if you guys support us on Patreon, <laughs> com slash wrestling mayhem show, and be our box. That has been our so, solution. The, the question since the first pod camp is how do we make money podcasting? That's the solution is Patreon. We all we do get paid in pizza. We we, we, we do get pizza already from Slice on Broadway. So let, Hi guys. Let, let's seriously talk about that though for a second because and I, I don't I'm not ignoring you guys, but they're on the whole. Um, <laughs> but so to monetize the podcast, you're using Patreon. And for those in the room who don't know what Patreon is, you want to explain that? Um, it's uh, think think of Kickstarter. You could just uh, pledge for each episode. Basically, yeah. and like tiny, tiny little like microtransactions. Like yeah. we get, uh, I have a uh, don donator, donator Patreon. I have a Patreon, have a Patreon. for Patreon. Pale Riot who pays uh, fifty nice. cents, fifty cents uh, per episode, and that's this guy right here actually. So um, back to the cause. Yeah, but you can you can give as little as like a quarter or something like that. Now the high end of this is uh, Tom Merritt who had left uh, this week in tactically little port. And uh, he went off on his own and did his own his versions of what he was doing, which was like a daily tech news show, which is actually the name of it. Clever, um, and a, uh, another uh, court court killer show, and uh, it's completely supported. That's basically his job. I think he does some other production work too, um, but he's there and he's on Google Hangout with people logging in in his home, and uh, and he's, he's he has like something like. 2,000 people or something on Core Killers, even more for Daily Tech News Show, and that's how he supports us. Now he's already got an audience. He's been doing this since like CNX Buzz Out Loud and doing that kind of a show for 10 years. Uh, so, so he's bringing that with him, and we're kind of like, well, we have some of an audience, a dedicated audience. We'll get a little bit out of it. How do we get like 10 bucks a month out of something? You know, uh, somebody just started uh, donating to Awesome Cast, uh, which is a business in Cranberry. Uh, hello, that's we'll see. Um, which I'm still figuring out what you guys are, uh, but uh, but thank you, and and, and that's a, that's a side of it. So we're kind of looking at that, and we're looking at the advertising, and, but we're not making giant, giant, giant like five thousand downloads an episode that that people want to get your Audible and your Squarespace, yes. you know, kind of yes. stuff. Yes. 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 So what you're saying basically is, you are you're starting to find the way to monetize and sustain what you're doing, and you're proving that. Uh, these other gentlemen that we're talking about are doing it at a lifestyle supported level. Right. Okay. Right. So we can't be done. Yeah. Yeah. It's feasible. So from the monetization standpoint, we've got that. Now let's look over here to my right. Because I don't think this is what Doug does for a living. And I know that John doesn't do this for a living. No. And we, we had a sponsor once, it was like a it was a record company that paid us a decent amount per episode to be advertised on the show. But it was a record company, so they quickly ran out of money. Um, <laughs> that was, that's a dying media platform. Well, right? you, Nobody does music anymore. You had you had banner ads now on your site, didn't you not? You, you I'm talking okay. to the moderator. Could be any of us. Um, we did banner ads briefly on uh, something that we desired. We also did sponsors that we embed in the show, um, but we never really made money. Uh, the, what we actually ended up making money on was the advertisements from uh, Blip TV. So when we would host uh, something to be desired, uh, I didn't want to host it on YouTube originally. Uh, I was a little skittish about giving YouTube, uh, and a, therefore Google, the rights to own all this media. Uh, so I went with one of their competitors, Blip TV. It turned out to be an amazing choice because Blip TV is going out of business next week. So the lesson is don't not use YouTube. There's no way around it. But what was interesting about being on Blip for years was uh, we would get checks uh, in the mail, not in the digital mail, the PayPal mail, every so often, 
uh, for the number of pre-roll ads that have been sold against our media. So you can do the same thing with Audible, you can do the same thing with other video sites. You don't necessarily have to have a sponsor, you just have to have an, an audience that other people are willing to pay to get in front of them, which is an, it's its whole insidious uh, way to make money, and we've been doing it in this country that way for more than 100 years. So that's why your media ends up in that ecosystem. And, and I think, um, and a lot of the bombs kind of falling on and even that right now is the discussion. So I think the the integrated ad, the, you know, something where it's integrated in the show, and like we like we just randomly talk about slice on Broadway just because we dig the pizza, and, and, and then the guys on the show, even like the guy in Poughkeepsie, New York, and in San Antonio, Texas, are like creatively uh, uh, plugging the thing throughout the week and on other shows that we don't even officially are plugging the, the sponsor on, you know, and it's just integrated, and then now we have somebody in Portland that's like tweeting us about Slice on Broadway or something, you know, like stuff like that. God bless you. Um, it, it, it's just, uh, you know, you need to be able to talk to your audience. You can't just support, like, I don't want a Squarespace. I don't want an Audible. I want our sponsors that we believe in that our audience is going to get, and I know that's going to have more weight we still have to prove it to some of these people, but you know, but I think that's the way you're going to need to go. Well, and then to, it's funny you mentioned Squarespace. Just to take it to like the um, the top level of what's possible in podcasting these days, uh, the Mark Maron podcast. When uh, President Obama was in there, if you notice, the very uh, first thing he says on it is brought to you without commercial interruption by Squarespace. So right. I mean, there are businesses that are investing in podcasts, and they see that as a legitimate media delivery system for their own sponsored message. So if you are interested in creating media and you can build an audience for that media first, that's the first step. You have to make something that people actually want to spend the time to uh, listen to or watch on a regular basis, and they have to know that you're going to be reliable and consistent with it, and they'll come back to you and listen to that on a regular basis. But once you prove that's there, that's available, uh, you have sponsors who will then say, we want a piece of that, we want to get in front of your people, we want your data as well. And you, as the creator, now get to decide, do I want to open the gate and let sponsors have access to these people who trust me with the media? It's a double-edged sword because you need to stay in business, or at least you need to cover your costs. But at the same time, you don't want to necessarily um, send your sheep to the wolves. So you may want to figure out early on how you feel about that before you dive in. One, one good example, it's not podcasting, but uh, if anybody familiar with Penny Arcade in here? Um, I believe the story is they accidentally gave their rights to somebody else when they were trying to figure out publishing and advertising and stuff, and they had to fight to get all their like the rights to their old stuff back. Well, so yeah, that's the other like, issue too. Like if that's the other yeah. If you're creating digital media and you're putting it online, uh, make sure that you know who owns that media. You know, uh, every tweet is yours, but other people can also share that media without your consent. Every video you yeah, put, no, didn't you end up in a book that way? Then we just talk about. We did just talk about that. Uh, just to touch on the sponsorship thing really quick. One of the issues that I run into is I can't have a brewery sponsor us because then they're not going to get an unbiased opinion. Right. And that's one thing that we've always been very strong about. We've we've said that the show is a deficit podcast because we can't have sponsorships in that way. Uh, there have been restaurants that have said, "Hey, can you guys sponsor us?" But in the end, it's just uh, it's a glorified commercial, and it's places that we go to that really, we don't believe in them. And that's one of the big things. We want to keep it local too, but it, we want to make sure that we actually like your food, we like your service, and it's not just someplace that's throwing us money to kind of save face publicly. And yes, I was mentioned in a quote. <laughs> a very weird way that I found this out. So a friend of mine sends me this tweet and says, uh, did you know you're in a book? You've been quoted. And they used your Twitter account. Now, if you've seen my Twitter account, at Douglas Sturta, Friday nights, Saturday nights, they can get a little interesting on there, especially after we've done a couple shows. So the first thing in my mind is there's over 60,000 tweets. I can only imagine what's probably in this book that I haven't seen yet that someone in my family is going to pick up and show it to my family. This is going to get good. And it ended up being, uh, because I'm originally from Erie, it was a comment I made about the Rust Belt, and the book, I believe, was about the Rust Belt, or somewhere in there. But it's the fact that a tweet that, is, one of my tweets was used in a book, the author never said, hey, I'm going to use this. Not that they have to, but it would have been good to know so I could possibly promote the book. But uh, yeah, it's just it was a public tweet that was out there, and anyone could just take it and put it into a book and, and see it in Barnes & Noble. So now your account is private, right? It used to be. I opened it back up again just to see what would happen. And I've had a lot more fun with this. So put it in your book. But I have multiple accounts. So. 
Uh, and so let me ask uh, of the two of you. So we've talked a little bit about the monetization. How do you, how did, in John's case, how did you actively grow your audience? Like, uh, what are you doing to go out and find and incite new people to come in the door to listen to your podcast? Where does it go? Did. Yeah, it might be different now. At the time, the audience was, there was a small built-in podcast audience. Podcast might have been one of the best things we did to, to grow an audience. Um, you know, there have been waves of podcasting, and podcasting is now internationally known. But at the time, uh, a lot of the listeners were also creators and would be become creators. Um, we, don't, we don't really know. We organically grew an audience that our, our efforts to proactively find an audience really didn't pan out. We did a lot of live shows. I remember those, actually. The live shows were really popular, and the, uh, the club owners always wanted us to come back and do more shows. They were popular, but they didn't get us any spike in audience. Because the people that came out to a live show at a club were not geeky enough at the time to listen to podcasts at the time. Yeah, you were ahead of the curve. When we started out, uh, I think a podcast definitely helped us get our name out there, but we would do a lot of live events too. And at the time, people just weren't, they weren't on the mobile devices, so they weren't you know, writing down you know, what our show was. They'd come out and say, hey, yeah, all right, hey, you've got some podcast thing, and that was it. So. Live events didn't help us so much with growing our audience, but it got us more comfortable doing live events. So that down the road, when we started doing beer fest and started doing conventions, we were more organized, we were more comfortable in front of the microphone. And then, uh, then we found out that all it takes is one mention on, in a magazine, or in our case, someone gets a hold of our YouTube video and puts it on a, a beer form. And we get 17 pages of hate that people all of a sudden decide, hey, this, this is what these guys are talking about. And that was in 2007. So now it's a lot easier with Facebook and with this. Google Plus is huge for us, actually. The network that apparently nobody I'm else is so using. Sorry. But yeah. beer drinkers and, and wrestlers. <laughs> and podcasters. It's a good podcaster. Yeah, yeah podcast. Shout out to podcast group therapy. Everyone seems to be, uh, well, our crowd seems to be on Google Plus. So we make a post and it just it goes all over because we found that's where our community is. There's not a lot of ads on there. They can go get their information, talk to other people that are beer geeks. And, and that just that definitely helps us grow. And so are you when you're doing a show, are you thinking about how it's going to be promoted as you're as you're preparing to do the show? I have a set list of, of where I'm going to promote everything made ahead of time. So I think about the show with okay for this platform, I need to have this kind of shot taken. It's if I'm going to do video, if I'm doing audio, I keep in mind the different outlets that I have for it. Uh, yeah, it's just, there's a lot that goes into planning a show, especially when it's just one person doing it now. When there's two of us that were doing it, we can kind of pass the work off. And that's why there's been a, a kind of a, a pause in between shows is because of the time it takes when we can get a show together, get interviews lined up and get everything done, and then actually get the show out. So there's, there's a lot of that goes into the process. It's not just turning on a microphone and then just talking about it. There's who am I going to promote this with, who do I need to get in contact with, and planning the whole show. And on your end, uh, I feel like you make so much media. When do you have time to plan it or promote it? Planning? What? <laughs> um, no, actually we've been trying to get a little better about the planning, especially in the wrestling show lately, um, because we realize like, this is just an unwielding like, topic. And, and we, we get so many like, different people involved, and we just kind of had to rein it in at a certain point. Uh, so that, that's been kind of the discussion lately and, and kind of figuring out, okay, no, these are the topics we're doing, this is this segment. We can't just say, so what happened this week? Because then we did that for the longest time and sometimes we would be get more organized and fall back in that trap again because we've done so long. And again, like, how many people are involved in the show? I don't even know. Like, because we, we just like bring people in and, and it's always, and, and, and they're maybe not, you know, they they just kind of want to come on and talk about wrestling. You know, it's maybe their motivation. but. You know, we we have to step up and say no. We have to make sure this has a certain level of quality. So we kept getting more of you guys. You know what I mean? Um, so, so you're so you're brand conscious as you're doing it. You you know what your audience well, expects. Yeah. Well, well, we're we're we know to get more audience, it needs to be at a certain level. Um, but but we also know our brand of how we talk about wrestling is not the um, the mass way of doing it. Like, you know, we know, you know Justin LaBar does Chair Shot Reality here. He's talking to a very mass audience, even when he's talking about, like, versus how we talk about it. There's, there's a difference between um, most wrestling podcasts who approach it as uh, news items and 
we like to think that our podcast approaches it as fans. We have deep conversations about men in spandex. Sometimes yeah. we do. Yes. And, and yeah. there's a market for that. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. As that one whistle just proved, there is. Yes. <laughs> so, so, like, some, I mean, there, there are podcasts out there that, um, that, you know, have actual, like, consistent every single week they have a new wrestler on, they talk mm-hmm. to them, they're their guests, um, and they approach it like, uh, like they're covering news. We get together with our friends and talk about wrestling, and that somehow has persisted through 10 years of doing this. As far as like kind of the gamut of the many things that we do, so there's that's how we do that. We're basically like, okay, what are the two big topics we're gonna talk about? He does a big question, and we turn that into a contest thing, and I give away, thankfully I have the, the, the pro, the indie wrestling stuff, so I can give away a digital download every week. So that's, that's kind of our trying to get new people involved in that way. Um, but then we're getting a, a guest every week for Indie Mayhem show, which I split that with my friend in San Antonio, who's uh, becoming an announcer for a promotion down there. So now we're not just getting p- people in Pittsburgh, you know, that I interact with. We're getting people down there, and we get some decent names every once in a while. And it's, it helps that we have fr- friends in the wrestling industry that are on TV now. Yeah. That, they come back every once in a while, and that's really nice. So basically, to answer your question, uh, word of mouth. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, that's. A- because it was a, you were asking about promotion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Once upon a time. Yeah. Right. yeah. How many Twitter accounts do you run? Oh, geez, I kind of the other who sleep because I see each podcast. I mean, I'm very seventy-five. Is the ballpark answer right? Yeah. Between clients and podcasts, and podcasts are the biggest one. There's like at least twenty, and then there's my dog and my cat. And so, I mean, you know, we're out there. And then there's that. <laughs> then there's that Spanish wrestler that I just Google translated everything to. <laughs> yeah. So. The act of creating the media is time consuming. And that's okay. something as as you're creating media, you've got to set that aside. And also as far as promotion, uh, my Wednesday is all processing and setting up tweets and everything for everything we did Tuesday night. Like that's almost entirely my Wednesday at this point, as far as my business day. You need interns at this stage to yes. run the semi automated part that's, of the production company. That's what I'm going to. That's what that's what I'm really wanting to get to. I just invented a fake intern for my show. That seemed to that seemed to uh, take care of the problem. <laughs> I don't know that would... when, whenever anything just doesn't go out. It's a lot of interns. The best Uber you... for interns. I think <laughs> it's the idea that got <laughs> The problem with fake interns is you spend more time managing them. That's true. Yeah, you get an intern yourself. And then they start arguing with your underground hobo character also on Twitter, and it just you just lose an afternoon, right? Yes. So the point uh, is that not only though do you need time to produce, but you need time to promote. It needs to be structured. Because and if you're not doing it, you're making media that no one's going to see. Um, uh, I, Sri, I, I'm probably mispronouncing that. He's making a, up words. I'm not making up words. He's a guy that was here at Point Park. <laughs> He's a communication and social media guy at, up at, at the Met in New York, and he was here talking. And I remember he was saying, hey, you know what the best way for nobody to see your video? Uh, make it and tweet it once. Yeah, like because it's there's so much noise, so we could just sit and do a podcast and hope somebody shows up. But you have to stop doing that. That's something I'm trying to get some of the other guys making shows on our network. It's like, great, you did it. You realize all the stuff I have to do to support the thing that you did, and uh, make sure you're putting it out. You know, because the thing that kills me is when you have co-hosts that don't. If my co-host friends don't know they do a podcast with me, that's a problem. <laughs> well, and I want to actually touch on that real quick because because if you know it, but. Uh, I was talking to someone who I thought was my friend yesterday. Uh, she said, no, she is, she totally is. But we were uh, standing at the uh, icebreaker and she was asking questions about things that I have you know, been fairly blatant about on Facebook recently and she had no idea these things were happening. Mm-hmm. So uh, when you think that you're creating media and you're putting it out there and you're using Facebook or Twitter or the other tools and you're following all the best practices and you think, well, you know, I've got, say, uh, I have, uh, have 6,000 Twitter followers. So if I tweet something, do all 6,000 of them see it? Well, no. If you look at the analytics, usually about between two and 300 of them will actually quote unquote see what's uh, available. So Facebook's algorithm is the same way. You think people are seeing everything you're sharing, only a small percentage of them are seeing everything. So what you might think of as over-promoting yourself is only over-promotion to that small sliver of people who are already seeing it the first time. The reality is they're never gonna see it unless you promote and promote. Uh, this is a conversation because Will was like, you know how many teen times I see a tweet from you? Yeah. Like, because he follows all of my accounts. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not the, the only one. They don't see all of these tweets. Yeah, and so it's like, I apologize, but I need to reach everybody else that isn't following everybody. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So. so I want to take the, do you have something specific you want to throw? 
So my day job is actually a digital marketing manager. So back in the day, like well, four or five years ago, we always said just put, you know, just tweet out once or twice because you don't want to seem like you're being spammy. And now today we're like, forget everything we told you three or four years ago <laughs> yeah. because it is the same case. It's and I was telling Sorg about this that on our Facebook page we have about you know a few thousand followers. I made a post, nine people saw it. Now, if I throw up some cash, all of a sudden 2,500 people are gonna see it. Or if you put that message in a video. Or if you put it in a video. So there's a lot of tricks to it. And every day, part of my job is I look at my Facebook ads, I look at Google Analytics, I'm looking at Twitter Analytics, I'm looking at all this stuff to figure out what works, what doesn't work. And really, there is no simple formula to it. Just, if, you're, if you are gonna tweet stuff out, don't do the same tweet like three or four times in a row. Feel free to do it over and over again, but kind of mix it up a little bit too. And that's what's helped out our show is for my show, I have to get used to saying my show because it's only me now. <laughs> it's you in the world, Doug. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Mike. It's you in the world. And, and, and you, because you're my other your subscriber, I'm sure. Um, damn, I lost my point I was going to put there. Um, oh, yeah, and the other, end, the other end of that, if you're promoting, yeah, get that out there. But make sure you got good content at the other end of that link, too, when it shows up. So. Yeah, and the last point to make, I think, about Facebook is you're at the mercy of Facebook's algorithm. So as we've been talking about, for example, you'll say something and Facebook decides to whom it's going to be relevant. So uh, to Doug's point, maybe you start figuring out what works really well and you start promoting those kinds of things specifically. Maybe photos are doing really well for you, so you start making a lot of photos from your media or certain kinds of quotes. When Facebook realizes that other people are gaming the system, just like Google does with the search engine algorithm, they change it. So what worked for you a couple months ago suddenly stops working for you. Or they start strangulating the organic reach. So you're reaching fewer and fewer live human beings and Facebook is expecting that you will instead invest in paid advertisements. That's how they stay in business. So as we saw on the keynote, there's less and less options to be seen. And now Facebook is in control of how it gets seen and if. So, uh, I want to kick this to the audience in two more questions, but I wanted to open those up real quick here. Um, what are the tech setups that you use? For anybody who's out there who's wondering, uh, is there specific um, microphones or specific cameras, specific media that you need or would recommend that they use programs? Oh, jeez. Uh, are we just you talking know, you guys about, have a lot to think about. You know, just the 10 lines Why don't you two make a note over there of the, of the 10 list. things you'll mention? You use a lot but, I, use, I use a lot less because I don't, he has awesome. a whole studio set up. I mean, I have right, video, just, so I kind of have a bit. Right, yeah. I have, I have uh, one microphone, which is very similar to this one. I have a uh, flexible boom mic because I have one desk. So you look fancy on the video so podcast. I look fancy on the video yeah. podcast, yeah. And, uh, and I use Audacity, and that's it. Yeah, that's all you need. That's, uh, that's really all you need. I mean, what if it's I've, got a, I've got a nice desktop computer that does everything I need it to do, and that's um, that's um, my version of it. I'm in the process of teaching somebody the podcast on his own. He's very mobile. I'm like, just get a blue snowball mic and set it right. And, uh, <laughs> and, and on Audacity, <laughs> or it's Blue Yeti. Blue Yeti. <laughs> no, no, this is another one, too. Yeah, okay. No, I've been calling it Blue Ball lately for some reason. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, well, no, you just need that, plug it in, use Audacity, or if you're lucky enough to have a Mac, GarageBand is amazing. Um, and that's really all you need, and you just need the time to get skilled at those programs and skilled about talking to a microphone and confident. Like, that's the s software you need. Yeah. Wow, that was the move of the weekend, ladies and gentlemen. I enjoyed that. I hope you all took a picture. Uh, but you're right, that you don't need a whole lot of upfront investment. Uh, but what's interesting, though, is uh, John, and you guys had a massive investment upfront. And I, it worked, right? Like the, the show looked and sounded amazing. What did we buy? Uh, I don't know. You had an entire room that was dedicated to podcasting. And well, we, we, had, we did well. My partner was DJ at the time, so but we, we did have. It's nice when you can co op that. So. Yeah, yeah, we did have professional audio equipment, and that's the biggest thing I would say is invest in a good mic. And then, is there anything else that makes the process easier that is worth investing in upfront? Like, is there. A, I hate to say shortcuts or hacks, but is there anything that you think would save someone a lot of time? Yeah, well, if you have a boyfriend who's a DJ. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually really good advice. Right now, right now. Say, okay. <laughs> Doug, is anything different? When we started out, we used a webcam, basically, and tried to rip the audio off of that. That's why our first five or six shows really sounded like we were recording in a box, because it's it was a $15 webcam. We really didn't know what we were doing with it. And thanks to places like PodCamp, or events like PodCamp, we figured out you know, basics for getting into audio. And I've learned a lot from Sword too, just some little tricks here and there. And then that progressed into, we actually bought a mixer, we bought professional microphones, 
and realize that that is a pain in the butt to take on location with you because you're taking this huge box and you've got expensive equipment and laptops and, and people are spilling beer everywhere and water and it's, it became a nightmare. So now the, the way I have my setup is I still have the microphones in the mixer in case I want to use that. But I just fire up my laptop and I get my webcam going. I have a uh, H4N handheld recorder. I plug that in and I record on Google Hangouts. And the great thing about this is after you do your show uh, as a hangout online or hangout live, um, you can actually take the, download that video off of your YouTube account and then strip the audio out. And I've got an audio show, I've got a video show, and I can edit it all at one time. That's how we've added so many shows because all the all of our friends like we're just like don't just go. I show them the Google Hangout how to do that, and they and all of a sudden we have all these new shows. And it's like, hey, we started a game show. I'm like, you did, <laughs> you know? And and but, but no, that's well, the Hangouts has been fantastic for me because I can get interviews with brewers from all over the country. We have pretty much HD video quality going. Most of them will plug right in, and that's the key thing for Hangouts. Is you you're very dependent on the wireless. Well, yeah, you're very dependent on the guest on that. And as far as the video side, I think we covered mostly for audio. Um, like I, I have a lot that I've really kind of packed together over these years. But really, like to get started on a video podcast kind of thing like that, Google Hangout is like most of the things I do in my studio with like how many computers do I have? Like six, seven, like six, seven. Yeah. yeah, something like that. And I, I, I don't really use them all that. Look, you came here like you only use them two. Well, I mean, I, we, we, we used to use all. Just play um, Minecraft. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Backups. The Minecraft servers over there. Um, I mean, you tell me about Minecraft. No, I don't know. Why do you Minecraft server? <laughs> Awesome. But but most of that stuff that what I do there is taken care of with Google Hangout, and and I think that's just a killer killer app, and and apparently not for Google Plus anymore. Um, Wait, when you're saying Google Hangout, are you attaching any external cameras to it, or is it just the built-in webcam from the? Well, you can. Everyone's. I mean, you can make that. I, I, you have to do. I think I don't know if they they have support for. I don't know. They're doing fancy stuff back there with it. But uh, uh, you know. I, I think you, you can't plug in like a FireWire or something, but like you can get a good USB camera mm -hmm. webcam, which you can pay like 200 bucks for a webcam to get a really decent oh, HD yeah. one, sure. Um, but but I always tell people, you know, okay, hey, you got a laptop within the last like three years, right? It has a webcam, you can plug in a mic to it, Play, spend 50 bucks on a blue snowball, and you're ready for a video show. Yeah, you know, when to we, start, to start. When we were doing something to be desired and the baristas, we were filming it all on these little mini DVs. So this is how long ago. It, and you were editing it on like a Power Mac G4. Oh, like yeah. Still in 2011. Yep, like Final Cut Express or yeah. something. Or I don't know, yeah. So the cost of entry to creating media keeps getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And the quality of the media you could produce with these out of the box. I knew there's a, a movie that came out this year called Tangerine mm -hmm. uh, that is getting rave reviews for a number of reasons. One of them is the cinematography. It was filmed in an iPhone. I used to drag, um, we did Pittsburgh Con or not, New York Comic Con in 2011, and I drug, uh, the over in room C is like probably the biggest camera I have, and I dragged that around the floor, and it was so heavy, my shoulder was killing me. And then I did the Gathering of Juggalos a few weeks ago. And uh, I brought, uh, Katie actually let me borrow her phone with a pink life proof case so I can survive the ICP Fago battle. And uh, that's all I used to film. And I think it looks better than most of the stuff. What it does, because it was SD uh, back in 2011, uh, but it just looks amazing. I could stand to buy a better mic for my phone, but it's HD. Like you have everything in your hands. It's also worth mentioning that, like, to do a good podcast, you don't need to do video. No, I mean not. the top podcasts on the internet right now are not video podcasts. They're all audio. Mark Maron is not doing video technically. IFC hired him to sort of do a video podcast, but that's, I think that's a different animal. Mm. No, that's true. Uh, and when you think about how people are consuming media too, right? To watch video, you have to sit there and pay attention to it. But to listen to audio, this is where your whole commuter audience comes in. And your, and your cubicle audience. Yes, things you can hide easily at work. That's where it comes in. So you, this Week in Tech has a million dollar uh, studio in Tyler I've seen it. It's freaking beautiful. Um, but he was just on there the other day talking about Leo Laporte on there uh, from Old Tech TV um, and Tech Guy Radio. He still has a radio show, by the way. You want to point that out. He's doing all the podcasts, but he still has a terrestrial radio show that he podcasts. Um, and there was time. I was like, we have all this stuff. We have all this great stuff. He sets and everything. But still, the majority of our audience is listening to audio. So, I mean, I think there's a little bit of an, there's a little bit of investment on that. I don't know where the payoff is. 
you know, in that kind of case. So, I mean, for us, our, our numbers, we don't do anything. Our payoff is friendships work. You're, when you're paid in love, it's all worth the investment. Right, yeah, exactly. One of the cool things too with using, I want to talk about very inexpensive tools. The really cool thing with Hangouts also is if you have two laptops set up, which normally I, I do for a lot of my shows, you can actually switch between screens and make it look like you've got an expensive video setup that you're cut between all these different cameras. When all it is is I've got four laptops in front of me, two of which I have to borrow from my friends to say I'm doing a show, so I can cut in between and have a website on this one, I could do uh, a live interview with somebody on this one. It's just each screen set up so it looks like a high-end a high -end production when it's just me at my dining room table with four laptops. That's a, that's and a, it's got lower thirds too, yeah, which is yeah. really cool. And you can add your own lower thirds that like you make, so it's not just the... the for the, for the folks that are have no idea what that is, what is that? That's the title graphic. It says, hi, I'm Mike Sorg at the, at the bottom. All right, so the question I'm going to come back to you guys at the end for is, we've been doing this for nine years now, where do you think it's going to be when we're at PodCamp Pittsburgh 20, God bless us all? But I'm not going to ask you, ask you guys to answer that yet. What I'm going to do is open this up to the audience, because I know that we're only talking about things here. I've seen some hands moving around, and I'm wondering, I uh, see um, tentative hands, tentative. Hand by the camera that I can definitely see. Yes, sir, would you like to stand up and shout your question at us? I sure would. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about that, like podcasts and everything, trying to get into it, but uh, I was wondering, is it, would you say that it's a bad idea to, let's say on Twitter, um, tag uh, or tweet to multiple podcasts that are similar, like um, like the wrestling, uh, the, the Mayhem show, like if I, if you tweet something, it is not a good idea to tweet other shows that are similar to that. When you say, okay, so to repeat the question in case you're not hearing it in the back, the question is, uh, is it a good idea or a bad idea to go onto a, a site like Twitter and tweet at the other media creators who are producing media like you? Like, are you somebody making a podcast or are you trying to like get them to see something or talk to them or, or, or well, what? Well, like, like, when you tweet to basically your competition. Oh. Yeah, that's, that's kind of it. I know a lot tweet us. Yeah, I can't, I, <laughs> I, I'm not sure how like competition works uh, with the podcast. Because I assume you can listen to it whenever you want, so it's not like you're competing against each other at the same time. Well, if you actually, if you're talking about competition, you're still competing for the same 24 hours. Yeah, technically, hours. You're, you're competing with everybody for, for, for attention, but, um, well, I mean, there's, there's different takes on that. Like, I remember early on MySpace, which I believe you were talking about earlier, that lovely site, um, uh, we, we were on there, and there was another site called Monday Night Mayhem. And like I'm, I like friended them, and they're like, "You better cut it out with that mayhem stuff." Like they own the name or something. I'm like, "Okay, we didn't even know you existed, but okay." Um, I I interact with a lot of other ones, like on Monday Night during Raw, I, because some of them are just funny, and I love interacting with them. And you kind of hope maybe our, you know, we expose us to their audience. And you also got to think, there's some people that listen to nothing but wrestling podcasts. I listen to almost nothing but technology podcasts. You know, I mean, and you're getting different flavors and different conversations with the same topic. So. I believe, and, and actually, I'm reaching out and trying to get other people of similar podcasts to come on and like, hey, come on and, and talk with us, you know, and we'll get on your show and just get a little bit different flavors. I just love getting different opinions on the subject matters, right? I think we're too small to really care that much about competition and stuff. Uh, the, the, the medium is too small, and and. Like, I, I believe in the kind of uh, everybody helping each other out and kind of growing together, not maybe as a network, but as just just in general, you know, because we're all kind of trying to figure this out, no matter even if you're a bigger wrestling podcast or anything like that, you know. So uh, I mean, I've, I'm, I've collaborated with quite a few other beer shows, and it's what I've found out is that we don't see it as competition so much because it's mostly it's just a bunch of, of friends just hanging out, talking about beer, drinking beer, and it's the way that our shows are set up is it's mostly based on demographics. So people listen to my show because I'm based in Pittsburgh. People listen to, uh, the, I believe, the beers because they're down in Austin. So we're all over the country, so we, we're not really fighting for too much, I guess, well, we're fighting for airtime, you know, for people to listen to us. But our, the, our fans and our, I guess, the core group of listeners are all based around where we live. People might want to hear what's going on in Pittsburgh, so they'll listen to me. They want to hear what's going on in Austin or Chicago, they'll listen to other shows. So, and they like when there's that crossover because then we can kind of get our audiences moved around to the, you know, to the different areas. But the, the other thing with craft beer, though, is 
craft beer isn't available to everyone in the country. Like what we make in Pittsburgh isn't available to too many states outside our surrounding areas. And the same thing with Texas and California. So people will listen just to hear what else is going on in other places. And the other element here too is what are you asking of them when you approach them? And what's the expectation you're setting up in their minds? Because if you're asking them to promote your show, they may be disinclined to do that because it may take attention away from them. If you're, if you're contacting them to point out that your show exists, that's a different story. Or if you're contacting them as a peer to sort of promote what they're doing, they may appreciate that. If you think about it from a blogging perspective, most smaller blogs start to grow when they reach out to larger bloggers and link back to them and say, hey, we exist, can we write for you? So there's that. That's kind of the inspiration was the whole guest blogger idea. I was like kind of a guest podcaster and guest. So I mean, it, it kind of, it, it, it's more natural, I feel, on a podcast. So the question, I think, for your, the, the long and short answer is both to your audience and to your fellow podcasters and media creators, when you reach out to them, what's in it for them? When you contact them, what is your expectation of how you want them to respond? And I think if you're doing it out of you know, the good nature of your own heart, then that's great. If you're doing it simply to provoke, that would be, I would, I would disabuse you of that notion. That's not a great idea. Well, certainly in the early days, there was a lot of guest podcasting. We were on your show, you've been on our show, I was on your show, one of them, um, as two different characters. Uh, I think that really it was just a community, and like Justin said, if you are doing it to promote, be careful. Uh, but what you're hearing is that there's enough difference usually in the two shows that uh, there's a there could be a crossover and a shared audience. If, on the other hand, you're just starting out and another show is doing basically exactly what you're doing but better, then I probably wouldn't tweet to them just yet. But I think there's something to be said for friendly competition, for learning from your competition. Yeah, you need to be, you really want the help of someone who's not you to look at what you're doing and let you know how it's coming across. I think that's very important. Because you might think your show is either amazing, or you might think your show is terrible. And you start to promote it to people and get it in front of them, and you find out that it's actually the exact opposite. So find a couple friends whose opinions you totally trust, and a couple strangers will be totally upfront with you, and ask them, is this working? Is this legit? If you saw this, is this something you would want to take time away from watching Inside Out or The Walking Dead to listen to or watch? Right? Are those the last two things you watch? Yes. <laughs> this morning, together. It's really, I couldn't sleep. Um, any other questions out there from the folks who are pondering? Lots of hands. Okay. Yes, gentlemen with baseball cap. So, I, I like to go back to the equipment question because I think the theory is on YouTube people accept a fuzzy video, but the audio has to be great. True. Right. And so, so now, uh, Mike, you mentioned this uh, blue ball microphone or whatever you call it, and. Uh, I'll see what you did. He's <laughs> <laughs> been playing with you for like two months. I'm, I'm trying to give you a layup there. But uh, yeah. anyways, is that That's something that actually would sound reasonable or do you recommend direct microphones? You know, Because if it's, pod, if it's an audio podcast only, you don't have the fuzzy video. You have to have good audio, would you say? And, yes. I, and I think like the, the those USB microphones, I think are, I mean, I'm not a audio technician by any means, but I think they, for getting you started, I think they're, they're tremendous, and you operate from there, you know. Um, yeah, you don't need a soundproof room. You don't no. need, like, uh, a completely high-end rig. What you do need, though, whether you're doing audio or video, is you're right when you pointed out people will accept substandard video quality mm -hmm. as long as they can hear what's going on. Right. And this might, we've been saying this literally since Podcast Boston <laughs> one, but people will look past uh, a shaky image or questionable graphics as long as the story is clear and understandable and mm -hmm. they can hear it uh, in such a way that it doesn't create additional questions for them. I mean, it, it's funny how your mind will fill in what's missing from the video, but they've done experiments where they reverse this and they have pristine video that you can't make out the audio and people flip out. And it's because our, for whatever reason, our brains are more content to put up with a fuzzy image Probably because our eyes are somehow less developed in the ear. Look at some of the earlier PodCam Pittsburgh session videos we have up on YouTube. You know, it's uh, that, that exact thing in practice. I look at the, the, the video bloggers who make it yeah. big too. No, no. I mean, I think especially if you're starting out, unless you're like, I'm definitely going to do this, and this is something that's going to happen, and I'm going to put money into. My big thing is, I don't want people to not get started with a thing because they think they need more money to get started. And there's, I, 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 I believe you should lower the barrier. 
And again, I keep saying, you have this in your hand. I'm freaking periscoping to the internet, you know? We could have just have everybody periscope everything and not even use Google Hangout this weekend, you know? Like that's, the technology's in our hands at that point. Um, and I think, you know, I, I know you're kind of concerned with quality and everything, and I think if that is a sticking point, you know, definitely kind of get a little more expensive one. But get the Yeti instead of the, the, the blue snowball. Um, I mean, it's like 50 bucks more, right? Um, and it's a good one. I know Norm Hillsman has one and stuff sounds great off of that thing. And, um, but I mean, that's, they're, they're kind of, they're made for podcasting and you don't have to worry about a board and all this other stuff. And I know you're concerned with doing a little more interesting things sound wise uh, from discussions we've had. Um, so you might be interested in a board because you want something more complex. Um, then at that point, skip the blue snowball, skip everything else, get a decent, uh, MXL is a good brand, Behringer is a good brand, uh, Behringer is really, like they're cheaper but decent quality, I've had a lot of stuff, I run wrestling shows and podcasts, that's why I have in my studio, um, except for Randall Elisis, that's somebody gave me that, that, that we swapped out, but, um, but no, I, I, I think that, that's, that's fine, you know, it, depends, it kind of depends on your goals. Let's let Doug have an in fact, if you go out to, uh, I believe it's Guitar Center out in Robinson, they, the, those guys out there love talking about how you can get into podcasting with their equipment. I've talked to them several times because I want to upgrade my mixer so I can start doing other things and bring in other audio sources. And they'll say, if you're doing podcasting, here's what you need. And it's, the mixer is, you can get between $100, $200. And you want a decent one that's going to have several. I told them how many possible inputs I'm going to have into it, how many microphones and other sources. And they said the same thing. If you want the blue snowball, think about that every time I say that. It's stuck in your head. It's scary. They have the snowball and they also have the Yeti out there. And it's usually in stock, and those are around 60 to 80 bucks, maybe $100 for some. But yeah, go out, definitely talk to those guys because they, they really geek out about stuff like this. And then practice. Uh, don't, if you can help it, don't release your first show. In fact, uh, I would recommend, if you're really concerned about it, if you're going into this from the, the worried about the first impression the general public's going to have of you, do a couple practice episodes. If you're going to do an interview show, for example, interview a friend of yours or someone that you already know uh, that you're comfortable talking to so you're not contacting strangers to interview them as your first show. Like, work your way up to a level of confidence and quality in what you're doing that when you do release that first show, it might actually be your fifth or your tenth but you've worked out those bugs and those kinks early on so that other people's first impression of you isn't, oh, this is someone who's just learning how this works. It already sounds at this point like, oh, this person knows what they're doing. I don't mean be perfect. I don't mean you have to nail it, but you have to not sound tentative and worried and concerned because it's not gonna carry. Yeah, I think I would say to, to add to that, think about the podcast that you already listened to. And it's, it's just like writing. If you're going to be a writer, you need to read a lot. If you're going to be a podcaster, you should listen to podcasts. Think about the podcasts that you, you absolutely love and what makes those good. What makes those the podcasts that you love? And then try to incorporate those elements. I'm not saying like straight up steel segments, but like um, the delivery and the, the way that the show is structured and things like that. And incorporate those into your podcast. Learn from the people who are already doing it successfully. All right, we have time for one more question, then we're gonna wrap, so you guys can reach the next room. Is there one more question? If there's not, we'll just start there. We, it's like a fake hand. Yes, yeah. gentlemen with the backwards baseball cap. Um, starting a podcast, I have a PC. What would be a good program to use to start getting started with podcasts? Audacity. Audacity. It's free. Yeah. Would that be Audacity. Audacity. Okay. It's free and it's got all the bells and whistles you'll need. Right. And there's a billion resources to learn how to use it. Yeah, look on, look on YouTube to get the tutorials for any of the programs you're starting out with, to get all the hacks for them up front so you can save yourself a lot of time and a lot of mistakes and a lot of accidentally deleted podcasts. Uh, probably, probably a good low, low end to get started if you want a little more, a little more professional. I, can't, I don't know what tier is part of, but um, um, Audition, Adobe, Adobe Audition. That's what I'm using, we were using that from back when I was cool at it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I know. Wow, yeah, that's, that's some MTS stuff there. Um, but uh, no, no. They, if you want to get a little more pro than that, because um, the biggest thing with that, I think you can get into it. But the biggest thing is noise reduction. If you have some room noise, like I, I noise reduce everything because I just don't have a compressor. Like I can't spend the hundreds of dollars for a compressor, um, so I just do it in software. Um, it's a little tougher I found with Audacity, but if, if you get the hang of it. 
Yeah. Uh, if you're going to do an audio podcast, be very aware of where it's being recorded. Right. Uh, right. Be very aware of your background. Well, if you're already pretty clean and don't need to do like any bells and whistles, you just need to put audio in and stuff and edit here and there and cut and paste. That's it's, it's great. It's great. Right. So, gentlemen, we have uh, three minutes left before it's runaway time, and that means that you still have to answer the question. I know you've been thinking about it. But, so. Nine years ago, we were just some dudes in a room. Nine years later, look at us. We're dudes in a larger room. Where is podcasting going to be in your mind nine years from now? Virtual reality podcasting. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not entirely joking about that because you've got to think about that because, I mean, we already have that crazy Google GoPro camera happening, right? And uh, when's, when's, at what point am I just going to be able to just get a bunch of iPhones, you know, all my old iPhones just kind of tie together into a 3D camera, you know? I mean, I, I really think that's because we, we move the video podcasting as like an actual possibility now. Um, and I think that whole kind of VR, like, you can be in my studio with me. There's my laundry over there. And there's, you know, I mean, maybe not quite as exciting, but I think, uh, I think there's a lot of experiences that can be in that. And, but I, think, I think it's so hard to predict because, I mean, looking at the devices we have now compared to the devices we had 10 years ago, you know, the way we consume media is, is um, it's at least uh, faster. And it's uh, it's more readily available, and there's of course a, a whole lot more of it. So hopefully, I don't know, in 20 years, it's an even bigger room, I guess. That's <laughs> well, I remember it was Pod Camp Three, I believe it was. We made predictions also about what it was going to be like in five years. I think we were pretty dead on with that. Was that things were going to go mobile. Um, looking towards the future, I pray to God it's a lot easier to subscribe to podcasts and listen to them if you're yeah. a, a PC user or an Android because Stitcher's not really cutting for me right now, and it seems like if you have a, a Mac device or an Apple device, you you can listen to podcasts anywhere you go. So I, I'm hoping that down the road that it's I can just have an easy way that if I turn on my TV, you know, it's, I can have podcasts available there. I can have it on my phone anywhere I go, I, on my radio, in my car, it's, which who knows what those are going to be like then. But that you'll be able to get podcasts no matter where you go. I think we've seen the jump now where podcasting is considered a serious medium especially with Mark Maron interviewing the president. I mean, that was a huge boost for us. Yeah. And now people are more, they're taking notice and cars that are gonna be coming up, you'll have internet access, you're probably gonna be able to get podcasting through there, so that's where I'm hoping to see it. Uh, the average length for a podcast will be about uh, 10 seconds and they will create themselves. <laughs> I'm terrified that you're probably right. Actually, no, actually, they're actually, they're working on this now. The, the host of the podcast will be a hologram sitting in the driver's seat of your self-driving Uber. You, you know there is like a podcast app called Clamor that's 18 second audio files only? I did not. <laughs> this is why you come to Podcamp, to learn these things. Yeah. Uh, and from my point of view, uh, I spent most of the time on the video side of podcasting. It's been interesting to watch how it's evolved. Um, you know, 10 years ago, those of us who were making serialized video content were hoping to get noticed. We're at the point now where uh, the girls who were doing Broad City on YouTube a couple of years ago were lucky to get 100,000 views for their episodes and they thought that was great. One of those viewers was Amy Poehler, who wound up getting the girls from Broad City on Comedy Central. So we're at a stage now where you can start doing web media and transition to those larger platforms. And I think in 10 years from now, you'll have people who can more easily start online and platform their way up without necessarily needing that intermediary of an Amy Poehler because the ability to reach a larger audience and get validated by them is gonna come not from Comedy Central, it's gonna come from Facebooks that we don't even know exist yet. So I'm very curious to see what's gonna happen in 10 years. Thank you all for coming. If you have more questions, we'll be making our way slowly out of this room.